I want to share my story with you guys because I think um, having a conversation with some of you guys, I see myself and you, and you guys kind of see yourself in me. And the reason why I want to have this conversation with you guys is to hopefully, my intention behind this is to have some kind of impact on your life. So I'm going to talk about three different things. That's three. Okay. So the first thing is, remember I talked about yesterday about the blind spots? Like we all have these little blind spots. So I'm going to talk about my own blind spots that I had and uncovered through coaching. And so what I want you guys to do when you're listening to those, see how that could apply to your own life. Like, consider it like, huh, I wonder how that could be for me. You guys follow me? Second thing I'm going to talk about is accountability. And Jason kind of mentioned that yesterday, but I want to, you know, talk a little bit about that because there's a big impact that happens in people's lives when we have accountability, especially for the people pleasers here. And the third thing is my big why. Because I think when it comes down to it, when you are about to do something, especially if you're up to something in the world, that big hairy why is what makes it happen. And we're going to talk a little bit about that throughout the day. So, you guys with me? Awesome. All right, very cool. So, all right, you already applauding? See, I'm done. All right, sweet. So, it's no accident that I have an accent, right? Uh, typically, it's funny because when we go to some of these events, right, uh, normally it doesn't come out that I am from Poland. So, people, you, know, you have an accent. I'm like, so I say, well, I'm from Texas. <laughs> Y'all. And then they go, really? I'm like, no, not really. So I was born in Poland in the 70s. I just dated myself. But uh, my first eight years of my life was under that communist regime because that Poland was a communist country, okay? So what happens when you're in a communist country is, especially what it was for me, is they provide you with living situation and the way it was for us we were living in a 12 by 12 room like in a hotel room so literally you go down the hallway and there's rooms off to the side and each family gets a room we had a 12 by 12 room and that includes the living room bedroom kitchenette uh my playroom which actually was like a small box like one of those cardboard boxes that you have right and you know the bathrooms were literally down the hallway, so when I was little, I don't want to paint you guys a picture, but imagine me running, you know, to the bathroom and going and peeing or have to take a shower or whatever, and then come back, right? But that's basically how it was for the first eight years as far as the living situation goes. And we were poor. I mean, to a point, my mom worked two jobs, and one of them was at a newspaper uh, company, and I don't know exactly what she did, but she worked there. So I remember that when I would go to school, like a, a preschool, and I was for the first couple years with nuns, so um, I would go there by myself, and then sometimes I would walk back and hang around with her, and I would read newspapers, whatever, in her office, and she would do her work, right? But what ended up happening is, when I was like six, seven, maybe even five, my dad, I think, started being an alcoholic, like really, bad, abusive, both mentally, physically, alcoholic. And it got to a point where actually at one point, I saw him drink perfume out of a bottle. Because it was such a, you know, and back then, I didn't even, I couldn't understand why he would do that. Like, why don't you just stop, right? Why can't you just stop doing that? Now, I do know that it's a disease, right? And it's not something you can easily control, right? But so what ended up happening for the first eight years was a lot of abuse. I remember actually one time I screwed something up and he had this military grade belt. Got my butt whooped so bad I couldn't sit for like a couple weeks. But there was this one moment that I remember I was about eight years old. My mom was pregnant towards the end of the pregnancy with my sister. And she we were sleeping at home. It was like two, three o'clock in the morning. And he came home drunk. 
he opened the door, walked in, walked everybody up, and started, started arguing with my mom because he wanted more money to go back to the bar. And whether she had the money or not, I don't know, but she said, I'm not giving you any money, I don't have any money. So that quickly escalated big time, right? To a point where it got physical. So they're fighting, and I'm trying to like protect my mom, and this eight-year-old kid jumps on him, he throws me off, so then she falls over to the floor, and he's kicking her. So I ran into the kitchen that we had off to the side. I grabbed the frying pan, and we had like the couch, you know how the arm of the couch, like it's higher and pretty sturdy. I would stood up on the couch behind him. I went like, hit him over the head with a frying pan. And he fell over and he passed out. And in that moment, I remember like it was yesterday, I said to myself, listen, I will never be like you. I will make sure that people like me because I don't like you right now. Nobody likes you right now. And I will make sure that if I ever have kids, I'm going to be a good dad. What do, you think, what do you think kind of a person comes out of that kind of situation? Could be a people pleaser. Do you guys see how that could happen? And then what was happening is as the times went on, I've had situations happen that reinforced in my mind that same kind of a thing. I will never do like this. I will make sure people like me, right? So I, that's what happened. A little bit later, I uh, find out my parents are getting divorced. And so I'm like, okay. So what happens now in the communist country, back then it was, well, you get divorced, state knows about it, well, no more living space. So we're kind of like out on the street. So what happened is, actually I remember they, at one point, my mom came to me with my aunt and they said, that, listen, um, so like we're getting divorced and you might have to go to the court and sit in front of the judge and tell them who you want to live with. Dad or mom. I don't want to make that decision. So, do I like making decisions? No. Right? But that never actually happened, but you know, that was a scary thing for me. So, a little while later, they finally get divorced, and my mom comes to me and sits down and says, listen, we don't have any money, I have to go make some money. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the United States, across the ocean, make some money, and you and your sister are going to live with my, with my sister, which was my aunt and my uncle. And I go, well, I don't want you to go. She goes, well, no, but I have to go. And I said, well, I don't want you to go. She's like, well, I got to go. And that whole conversation went on and on and on and on. Until I remember, we were at the airport, and back in the day, you guys remember, you can actually walk up all the way up to the gate with them and see the plane. So I'm still arguing and crying over, trying to get her to stay. And she goes, gives me a hug and starts walking off on the plane. And I said, can't convince my mom. How can I convince anybody else in my life? If my mom doesn't listen to me, who will listen? Do you see how that, now, that whole confidence kind of goes down? I can't convince people, and I can't, you know, have conversation with people to help them. Ironically enough, guess what kind of business I started later in life? Marketing. <laughs> <laughs> so, we go and live with my aunt. Between the ages of 8 and 14, my life turned around because they had a great family. Uh, they you know, had two sons, they had a beautiful house. For me, it was like living in a mansion. I mean, we went from one room to four-story house. I mean, I was like living the life, you know what I mean? And we started back then in Poland, like we were in like the traditional dance groups, so we were in a dance group. So we're starting to travel around the country, you know, performing in different stages. And then all of a sudden, I'm 14, I'm going to international travel. We were at France for like a festival. We had like 24 performances in 10 days, so now I'm a rock star, right? So I find out when I'm 14 that my mom is coming home for vacation. I'm like, awesome, I haven't seen her. Oh, by the way, this is for the younger people here. 
the way we communicated back then with my mom is in three different ways. One was a phone call. And the way it worked is on Sunday, she would call the city hall, and the guy actually lived in the city hall. He would pick up the phone, and she said, it's so-and-so for, for you know, Peter, right? He would, okay. And he, they arranged the time when she would call back that day. He would come over to our house, tell her mom's going to call back at 1 o'clock. We would go over there and wait for her to call. And there will be times she couldn't actually get through. Like meaning she was trying to dial and wouldn't get to the other end. It's called a busy signal. Remember that? Right. And then when she would call and we would talk to her, she literally sounded like she was across the ocean. You guys know what I mean? You, right? The other way is we wrote letters and recorded cassette tapes and send it to her, which pretty much about a year ago, I went over and I was hanging out with her and she pulled all of them out. She kept them all. Granted, they all sounded the same, <laughs> you know? But so she's here for vacation now, 14 years old, and uh, we're having a great time. And it's, she's, it's kind of wild because I haven't seen her for six years, right? So she's my mom, a little bit of a stranger kind of thing, you know? So we're having fun. Two weeks before she was coming back to the United States, she sits me and my sister down and she goes, guess what, guys? We're like, what? You guys are coming back to the United States with me. I'm like, why? She goes, well, because I kind of started my own life. I bought a house over there. And I want you guys to come with me and we start our new life together. I'm like, I don't want to go. I love my life here. She's like, well, no, we're going. I go, I want to go. She's like, we're going. I want to go. Going. Next thing I know, guess where I'm at? On the airplane. Reinforce my decision. I can't convince people. I can't, don't have a voice and all that kind of stuff. You guys following me? Why do you guys think I have such a loud voice? Think about that. I want to be heard, right? So here's the funny thing about the airplane ride. This is my first airplane ride ever, and this is like an 11 hour flight. So at some point I had to go to the bathroom, right? Went to the bathroom, flushed the toilet, I thought I broke the plane. Because <laughs> you know how it goes, oh, and I'm like, oh my God, did I just break a plane? I was scared. I went to my seat and I was quiet for like maybe a couple hours, hoping nobody's going to find out. <laughs> so, oh. so here's another thing. So I'm like, all right, fine, we're going to the United States. Now, the view of the United States back then for me was palm trees, big skyscrapers, Sunny weather, 14-year-old boy, beautiful woman, right? We land, and I end up in Detroit. <laughs> I'm like, where are the palm trees? Where are the skies, where are the skies, where are the beautiful women, and all that kind of stuff, right? So, no English, end up in Detroit. And literally the next day, we went to high school. I skipped eighth grade uh, because they did some assessments on me, but no English. So for like first six months, I literally sat in a classroom. And I would do is say here when somebody, when the teacher would call out my name so they get my attendance, right? So long story short, I learned the language, graduated high school, started playing soccer, all kinds of different things. And then after I graduated high school, went to college, uh, to get a degree in architecture. As I'm going to college, I'm working on weekends to make some money. So I was a dishwasher at like a catering restaurant. And then I moved up to a busboy. Then I moved up to a waiter, then a head waiter. Like I was on top of the world, you know, moving up in the world, right? So as I'm waiting the tables, you know, one day, I walk in into a room and I look across because we're setting up the room. I look across, there was a lot of new waitresses sometimes would come in. And there's this girl sitting across, standing across the room to the back of me. She's got like blonde curly hair. And I'm like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> so long story short, short seven years later, we got married. So we get married, we get one kid, a girl. Then we have a boy and another boy. The boys are like literally, um, 
less than 12 months apart. Like they call them Irish twins or something like that, right? Yeah, I was like, let's knock them out, right? <laughs> so, so anyway, so things are going well. Uh, then about 2007 comes around. You guys know what happened 2007, 2008? Architecture literally dried up to a point that I remember we were working in this big development and we were doing senior housing development. It was like a square mile that was like four developers, five developers in there. And when that thing hit in Detroit, and we literally, that subdivision was across from GM, General Motors. So like, you know, that's supporting the whole area, right? Developers, all they had to do is put finishing paint or put doors up on that house and that's it. They literally stopped, left and left the town. The houses were just left there, standing. So I saw what was happening, so I'm like, I gotta do something about myself, take control of my own life. And I always had this kind of a uh, feeling like, okay, how do I do it myself so I don't have to own, answer to somebody else? So I started learning a lot of stuff, school of hard knocks, and I was always infatuated with like internet, the marketing, and real estate since I was in architecture. So I'm like, okay, I'll put those three things together and start learning how to market that stuff on the internet. Eventually, I created my own course, training, and I started teaching real estate investors and agents how to market their houses and businesses on the internet. I don't know if anybody heard of Real Estate Black Book, it was back in the day, but that was me. Okay? So, I started, you know, doing this stuff, in the, you know, on part-time basis, bring, building up my business, started going to RIAs, and, um, you know, teaching that stuff, selling courses, and all that kind of stuff. And things were going well. And uh, I remember this one particular time that I was at one of the big RIA, and I spoke in front of a pretty big crowd, and I had like the best day ever. Like I sold a lot of product, you know, had some impact on people's lives and all kinds of cool stuff. So I am like on top of my world, right? I'm driving back home and I'm calling my wife and I'm like, listen, you won't believe what just happened. We're making it, we're finally, like things are happening and all that kind of stuff, I'm so excited. She's like, good, 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 you know? So I get home and uh, we start having conversation, we go to bed, and I've noticed that she's kind of not being very responsive. You guys know like when your wife or the girlfriend is not doing responding to you, like something's not up? Yeah, he's like, oh yeah, right? So I start poking, like probing, you know? What's going on? Tell me, I wanna know, what don't know? So she's like, no, never mind, forget it, never mind. We're like, she's like, fine, she goes, you wanna know what's wrong? I'm like, yeah, I asked. <laughs> So we go into the living room, we sit down, and she goes, I want a divorce. It felt like somebody ripped my heart out of my chest in that moment. Because what was I doing? I asked her, why? Why do you want to do that? And she's like, I can't live like this anymore. I'm like, what are you talking about? All I'm doing, that's like, she's like, you're never here, you're never this, you don't listen. I'm like, what are you talking about? All I'm doing is everything for this family. I'm doing this, I'm doing and I'm providing, you know? Like, and she told me like, listen, simple thing I'm asking you, like, where do you want to go for dinner? What do you guys think I would say? Wherever you want to go, right? What did she want? Simple decision. And my view was to like, listen, if I do whatever she wants to do, I will make her happy. For a while it did, but it didn't work at, any, at some point, right? Because I need to be the man, I need to step up, right? And she felt like every single decision in our marriage was on her, and that was weighing on her. Which, I found out as well that she was cheating on me. That did not go over well for me, because guess what? Now it reinforces my whole belief about, guess what? Not good enough, and people don't like me now, right? My own wife doesn't like me, doesn't love me. So for the next six months, I literally tried everything in my power, like I did with my mom back in the day, begging her, pleading, trying different things to get that marriage back. It was too late. And I remember, in fact, 
So since we have three kids in Michigan, the way it works, at first you have to resolve like the child support stuff. So we were in the front of court and we were talking about how much I'm gonna pay in the child support, whatever, and we're going back and forth, we finally agree on it. So the front of court person goes, you guys, why don't you go two floors down, get in front of the judge and get that taken care of, right? I'm like, okay, I hated doing it, but I'm like, all right, fine. So we go downstairs, get in front of the judge, and in that moment, I realized he's actually giving us the divorce, not finishing up that one thing. And I'm in my head, I'm like, whoa, 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 it's not time yet, what are you doing? This isn't time yet, I was totally not ready for it. So over the next, after that, I was so heartbroken. I was like, literally, my business, I lost the entire business. I remember that uh, list provider that like houses my list of people that I you know had on my list. It was Aweber, I don't know if anybody heard of Aweber, but I had like over 10,000 people on that list. They would email me and say, listen, you gotta send out one email at least because we're going to delete that list. I didn't care. I said, do whatever you wanna do. That list was gone, the list. My whole entire customer base was gone. I just let go of that business. So as I was walking through that time, do you guys know who Wendy Patton is? She's like the queen of these options. So as I was doing the speaking on the stages, right, I got to know her, she became a really good friend of mine, so we talked. So I'm talking with her at one time, and she goes, listen, I know this one guy that if you don't mind, I would like to connect you with him and see because I think you guys have some things in common because she went through a divorce and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, okay. So she talked to him, he says, fine. She gave me his number, and I called this guy, and we had a conversation, and it was like a love connection. <laughs> that guy is Jason. <laughs> Listen, we have not stopped talking since then. We talk every single day. And because of him, I got into life on there. And so got into coaching. That's how I uncover all those blind spots, because up until now, listen, when I was going through all these different things that I was describing to you, I had no idea why this stuff was happening to me. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm trying to make you happy. Why are you leaving? Why are you listening to me? I didn't know what was going on until I had a conversation with a coach, and he's like, dude, I finally discovered it. And listen, in the moment when I discovered that the, you know, the blind spots opened up for me, my whole life would like flash in front of me. So that's what basically happened out of the coaching. Now, here's the interesting thing about those blind spots. <clears throat> when I discovered those blind spots, for the next three months of my life, I made more money in my business than I did in the previous entire year. Why do you think that is? Well, these blind spots were literally like waiting on me. Like I uncovered them and now it's like a whole new world opened up to me. Like I was being able to take action because I finally got to listen. I'm not the guy who can't convince people or whatever the story that I had about it, right? I could just be with people, right? I had the whole thing about my accent. I told you guys yesterday, right? That, well, nobody will listen to me because I have an accent, right? Well, guess what, my accent now it's a huge benefit to me, especially with girls. So, so that's the whole thing about blind spot. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk to you guys about, so listen, does this, do you guys see that stuff in your life, how that could apply? Okay, good. So the accountability, and Jason kind of mentioned, because I don't think everybody was here at the last session yesterday, so I want to bring it up. But being the people pleaser, I knew for myself what Chuck said earlier, is that I will do whatever it takes for other people, but I won't do it for myself. Do you guys get how that could work? Because guess what? If I don't do something for somebody else, I'm gonna disappoint them. I don't wanna do that, right? But for me, everything else can go on the side. So the podcast, I've been trying to release the podcast where I would interview immigrants successful immigrants to see why they're so successful, right? That was the whole point that I wanted to do because I wanted to impact the immigrant community. Because I think their immigrants are freaking awesome. 
they're powerful. Like it takes something for us to drop everything behind, come here with a suitcase, or one of them, and go and speak to our teacher. I tell you guys, I interviewed a guy who's a good friend of mine. He's from Vietnam. He literally, they would draft them into the army. People would cut off their trigger fingers so they wouldn't be drafted because they know what fate was there. So him, 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 so he among with about 30 other people in the middle of the night one time got into this little fishing boat, laying like sardines so they're not seen, out in the middle of the ocean, hoping that somebody's going to find them. Can you imagine that? And then pirates found them, and then throughout everything, he ended up in Houston, and now he's a multimillionaire in real estate. <laughs> so that's the secret formula, by the way, to success. Okay? So, so the accountability. So I knew that that wouldn't happen for me. So I've been trying to release this podcast. It's not happening for a year because I had all kinds of, I had to get golden audience, I had to do this, I had to do that, right? The website and all this stuff. So finally, the coach said to me, listen, and that was at the retreat. We got to put accountability in here to make you, get you to do this. So we brainstormed with that room and with him how we're going to do that. So for me, it was agreed upon with me that if I don't get the podcast out by the next retreat, I am going to have to wear a Speedo throughout the next retreat. That includes me walking around the hallways in a hotel in a Speedo. Now, I know this is a great buy. But, do you think I want to walk around in a Speedo? No. Do you think I got it done? Yeah. It's, but listen, here's the important thing about accountability. I knew that I cannot skate by with them. You guys know what I mean? There is no way out. I can't make excuses for them because they're gonna hold me accountable. Listen, you, you didn't do it. Get the speedo up, let's go. Right? But in, typically in our life, what we do? Our friends, accountability, or our spouse or wife, we make a really good excuse, right? And then we're like, okay, you know what? All right, well, how about next week? Let it slide, right? And that doesn't work. So that's why this, in coaching, it's so powerful because, listen, do you think I let my students slide? Heck no. I had one student, for instance, he tried to get his podcast going and he couldn't do it to get like consistently with his episodes. So we created that every single time he asked me, I said, listen, so I knew that money was a big thing for him, right? So I said, okay, so every single time you don't release an episode, we're gonna, you're going to have to pay money. How much do you think it is? He goes, 50 bucks. I said, well, let's make it interesting. Because you're telling me that if I get you this accountability, you're gonna do these episodes, right? He's like, yeah. So you're confident you're gonna do that, right? Yeah. I'm like, well, then let's double it. Let's do 100 bucks per episode. He's like, oh. But you agree. And then I said, listen, so we're gonna set up an account. Every single time you don't do the episode, you're gonna put money in the account. Now, at the end of our, you know, uh, the goal that we reach, whatever money, by the way, he's a conservative, whatever money you don't, you know, get to put in the account, I'm gonna take that money and I'm gonna donate it to the Hillary account. <laughs> Fun. <laughs> Do you think that guy I'm going? You think he got it done? Yeah, but listen, me as a coach, it's my part to find leverage on you as a student and use it to get you to get what you want in life. You guys with me? Yeah. So the last thing I wanna share is this. Other thing that you wanna do in life is all good. You guys are creating the vision. You guys putting stuff on there. And let's say you wanna lose weight and you are looking to like, okay, I'm gonna go to the gym at six o'clock in the morning and then it snows in in medicine, it looks like this outside, six o'clock comes around and it's cold, it's like negative, you guys said negative temperatures now, didn't you? Just last week. How you do it, right? You'll find a way out of it, right? The way I look at it is one is the accountability, another thing is having a big why. 
why you're going to do this. And my why, I created it like this. So you guys know I have three kids. And I remember when my oldest mom was 11 years old, I would pick her up from school and I would say to her, hey, how was school? And she's like, boring. Well, what happened? Nothing. Well, listen, you can't tell me nothing. I want to hear what your day went. Why are you telling me nothing? You can't tell me that. Tell me what happened. Nothing. <sighs> right? That's how the conversation went. Anybody here knows what I'm talking about? All right, good. So, what was I trying to do? I was trying to connect with her, right? But here, the place that I was coming from, I was actually scared that I was going to lose her. Because I've heard everybody tell me, like, wait till she hits teenagers. You don't reach her now, guess what? It's all over. I was freaking out. So I was asking, trying to get in touch with her, getting hold of her, and all that kind of stuff. And guess what? I wasn't in her listening. All she heard is, well, I'm not good enough for that because I can't just say this. I have to be explanation and he's making me wrong about this and all the kind of stuff. Do you guys see how that could be? Especially knowing her, that's how it comes across to her. So why would she want to share anything with them, right? If it's never it's good enough, just sitting there is not good enough. So I actually created a new way of being with her. When I'm talking with her, a new way of interacting with her, being with her. And that is being curiously listening, being fun, being engaged. I actually created like a little game for myself. You know how there's a puzzle, right? And I, in my head, I said to myself, she has the entire puzzle. And every single time we have a conversation that works, that's engaging, she gives me one of those pieces over to me. And I can create the puzzle. But when I'm not engaged, when I'm just, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, whatever, that piece is not giving it to me. And now I have an incomplete puzzle. So that really kept me engaged. And listen, there are still some times where I get back into that old self, right? But I created being curiously listening. Now when I'm curiously listening, being over there with her, conversation is completely different. Do you guys see how that could be? So, I will tell you this. When I pick her up from school right now, and this is a really good thing, I say, how was school? And she goes, oh, you won't believe what happened. And there's some little and there's this friend, and I'm like, oh my God, what the hell is going on in that school? <laughs> like, so listen, I get to connect with her. And she tells me stuff that she would never have told me before. Even the crazy things that are going on in the schools today. But I wouldn't know that but she actually shares this stuff with me. So my big hairy why I do this stuff is to create and set up an example for my kids. What's it like to be the father? What's it like to be the husband for my daughter, right? When she grows up and wants to marry a guy, then it's a guy not like my dad. It's kind of like it's right who's going to treat her right, who's going to have a great impact on her life, who's going to build her up. Funny thing is, she has a really good friend in her school right now. God works in mysterious ways. He, she keeps saying, he's just like you, Tata. Tata is dad in Polish. So they all call me Tata. But she goes, she's just like you. He's all being positive. He's telling, tell, you know, like, huh, really? <laughs> but that's why I do this. Set an example for them. In fact, I have a vision of my wall, and they see it. Sometimes they call me out on it. But that's what it matters. So when I go and I poke at you guys, and I question you guys, and Chuck starts getting rough, or I get start, you know, really get down on the business, it's not because I want to break you down, or make you cry, or whatever it might be. It's because that I know you guys are freaking big people. You are people who can take over the world and do some amazing things. Because otherwise, guess what? You wouldn't be here. Ooh. Right? <laughs> so stop playing small. You're bigger than this. Create your why. Create your vision. And then go for it. All the different squirrels and everything around there can run around. You guys have mission. You. 
You have a voice. Go impact those women's lives. Every single one of you guys some kind of a mission here because you guys are here. So go do this stuff. So last thing I want to say, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak into your lives, to be here. You guys are allowing me to live my vision by being here. And if there's any questions, just come up to me, talk to me or whatever, and I'm here for you guys, okay? Thank you so much.